gas ban is the simplest and most effective way for the City of Eugene to meet its climate recovery goals and the City can and should pass one without delay. This video will focus on regulating natural gas. I'm Betsy Hitz, a volunteer with 350 Eugene, and I have with me today Danny Noonan. So Danny, let's start off with who are you in this context of regulating natural gas? Thanks, Betsy. Um, well, I am a climate and energy strategist at an organization called Breach Collective, uh, which was founded and is based right here in Eugene, Oregon. And our mission is to uh, partner with communities on the front lines of the climate crisis. And as part of that work, we are a member of the Fossil Free Eugene Coalition. So we're dealing with Eugene now. Can you tell us about um, climate policy in the city of Eugene? What's, what's been going on? The city of Eugene, interestingly enough, was a bit of a trailblazer in um, setting really ambitious uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets for itself. So back in 2014, it passed a, a climate recovery ordinance, which it uh, subsequently updated in 2016. And that ordinance set a um, target a community-wide target of halving Eugene's emissions by the year 2030. Now, of course, he set a target, but then the question is, you know, how do you achieve that target? And that's been a question that the city of Eugene's been grappling with for a number of years now. Um, and what it's, there continues to be quite a, a significant gap between uh, the policies that the city of Eugene has in place and this 50% by 2030 uh, goal. Um, and so back in 2019, the City of Eugene released a document that listed a number of uh, potential additional regulatory strategies um, to reducing its emissions and bridging that gap. This is known as the Climate Action Plan 2.0. Um, and one of the options listed in there was uh, to regulate uh, the gas utility in the city, which is Northwest Natural. So I know that a lot of the, the discussion has been on the franchise agreement. It's really been big in the news and big in, in the movement. Can you explain actually what a franchise agreement is and why we're so focused on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sort of in its simplest terms, a franchise agreement is a contract between the city, um, in this case Eugene, and, and a gas utility, in this case Northwest Natural, and that agreement um, allows the utility to use public rights of way and public land to, uh, to undertake its operations. You know, the kind of things you see in the street like Northwest Natural doing maintenance and hookups to, to buildings, those kinds of activities in exchange for a, a fee on the city's, uh, on, on the utility's revenue within the city. And I know that negotiations have been going on for, it seems like a long time, at least two years. Can you tell us where we are right now with those negotiations? Yeah, and, and I think it's also worth explaining what the sort of the strategy was that the city was looking at mm -hmm. with um, focusing on the, the franchise agreement as a, an option for reducing gas emissions. Um, the existing franchise agreement between Northwest Natural and the city of Eugene was set to expire um, in November 2019. And the city's thinking was that in negotiating a new franchise agreement, it could find a way to get uh, Northwest Natural to commit to reducing its emissions on a, a certain timeline, perhaps in exchange for sort of more favorable terms and in other parts of the franchise agreement. Um, what's actually happened is Northwest Natural's um, very steadfastly opposed any kind of emissions reductions com component uh, being included in the franchise agreement. And um, the uh, previous agreement was extended um, several times uh, by the city um, while these negotiations were ongoing, but things actually hit a bit of an impasse um, in uh, May of this year and the city decided to walk away um, from those negotiations, at least for a moment, and, and let um, the uh, current franchise agreement expire. So there actually is no franchise agreement um, currently in the city of Eugene. And so what does that mean? I mean, there's no agreement. Can they go out there and just keep laying pipes and making yeah, new hookups? The, the lack of a new franchise agreement uh, 
means very little in terms of the sort of day-to-day -day operations of, of Northwest Natural. Um, it doesn't mean that it has to cease operations or that it's operating unlawfully. And it also doesn't mean that the city isn't continuing to receive revenue. Um, what happens in this circumstance is there's a provision of the Eugene City Code uh, which um, allows um, or which governs um, gas utilities that are operating without a franchise agreement. And it essentially just uh, takes a fee from them in the same way that the franchise agreement did. Um, so very little has changed and um, I think perhaps this may uh, sort of underline or emphasise the um, how optimistic the city of Eugene was being in thinking that it could get um, a, a gas utility to voluntarily agree to reduce its emissions. I mean, the delivery and, and use of, of methane gas is such a core part of Northwest Natural's business model that it's very hard to believe that they would sort of commit to um, reducing its emissions without, you know, a sort of clear technological pathway to do so. Right, that's completely understandable. A business doesn't want to go under, but um, so I've been hearing that just focusing all the attention on a franchise agreement is not the only way to, to, to get, you know, towards a switch off of natural gas. Are there, are there other ways to do that? Yeah, so I think the simplest and most effective way to, for the city of Eugene to get a hold on its um, increasing uh, gas emissions is um, by passing an uh, ordinance banning uh, new gas infrastructure in the city, and particularly um, hookups, uh, gas hookups to new buildings. Um, based on research that we've conducted at Breach Collective, um, we think that the city potentially has a number of legal tools that it could use um, to pass such a ban, um, including its existing legal authority over public rights of way and public health and safety. Um, and while this would be a first um, in the state of Oregon, um, the city of Eugene would be following the lead of over 50 uh, cities and counties um, throughout the country who've passed um, similar gas bans in recent years, um, several of which have um, withstood uh, legal challenges in court from industry. So we think that the city would be sitting on pretty firm legal ground um, if it were to pass such a ban. I thank you, Danny. And thanks to you, our viewers, for watching this third video. And I invite you to tune in to the fourth and concluding video in this series when Sahara will talk about the youth climate movement in Eugene. So I hope that you've learned something about regulating natural gas, and I hope that you all share that information with others. For, for more information, I invite you to go to uh, three different sites. Uh, breachcollective.org is one, fossilfreeugene.org, and the third, 350eugene.org. Thank you. to this first of four videos on the theme of switching from gas to electricity in buildings in Eugene, Oregon. I'm Betsy Hitz, a volunteer with 350 Eugene, and I have with me today Jim New and Doug Bovey. Jim has been educating himself and city leaders and county leaders and many others on all things climate for over 20 years. And Doug Bovey is a medical doctor and member of Physicians for Social Responsibility, is especially interested in the effects of methane gas and global heating on health. Okay, we're gonna start with you, Jim. Your first question, could you describe the process by which gas is extracted and gets to our homes and our businesses? Yes, um, oil and fossil gas are extracted from the ground through vertical well drilling, now advanced to subsurface horizontal drilling called hydraulic frac fracturing or fracking in short. A mix of sand, water, and chemicals is pumped into the well, fracturing the rock and releasing the oil and the gas. Fossil gas is then distributed to the customers through pipelines. Fracking sounds like a very labor and resources intensive process. What are the problems inherent in fracking? 
Yes, good question. 70 to 140 billion gallons of water were used on 35,000 wells in the United States each year and 4 million pounds of sand per well. There are millions of abandoned, decommissioned, and contaminated wells across the United States that are using taxpayer dollars to re remediate because fossil fuel companies are not held liable. Risks associated with fracking are domestic and groundwater contamination and methane and gas leakage. 2.3% of gas traveling through pipes is leaked. Could you talk more about methane as a component of gas obtained by fracking? You bet. 87% of fossil gas is made up of methane, which is 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide in a 20-year period. This has caused 30% of global heating. Methane is generated and released into the atmosphere through both human activities, such as the fossil fuel industry, landfills and manure management systems, and natural or biogenic processes, such as animal digestion and fermentation and oxygen, uh, and um, poor environments like wetlands. Human cause activity accounts for 50 to 65 percent of total U.S. emissions of methane per year. The fossil fuel industry alone accounts for 39 percent of the emissions. Though so-called natural gas is of nature, not human produced or synthetic, climate concerned people use the terms fossil gas, frac gas, or most recently methane gas, as these terms more accurately denote what this gas is. While the gas industry sticks with natural gas to promote the strong positive feelings we have for anything labeled natural. Could you talk about the gas industry's efforts to stay in business? Yeah, the, the fossil fuel industry is greenwashing gas as a bridge fuel from coal until renewable energy sources can compete. They also label their product natural gas in, in order to move, make it more acceptable to the public. However, fossil gas is still federally subsidized to continue production Wind and solar are less expensive than fossil gas and currently operate worldwide at utility scale. Locally, EWEB has assured the City Council that they can provide adequate energy resources if fuel switching from gas to electrical appliances. Finally, what parting words do you have for our viewers? Well, there's two parts. Locally, according to Eugene's 2017 greenhouse gas inventory, 30,000 frac gas customers create 11 times more greenhouse gas emissions than 86,000 electricity customers. 32% of greenhouse gas emissions in buildings or in Eugene are from buildings. And finally, every major study on meeting climate goals at state, national, and international levels call for fueling buildings with renewable electricity rather than fossil fuels. Thank you, Jim. Now, Doug, it's your turn. Gas is burned in Eugene homes and businesses to heat spaces and water, dry our clothes, and cook our food. Tell us about adverse health effects associated with these uses. So the biggest problem with gas in our homes is the pollution caused by combustion of methane. And in the case of heating or drying or uh, hot water heating, most of that combustion pollution is vented outside. But in the case of cooking, it's not. It's vented into our kitchen. And um, that's the problem. The problem is the combustion of gas in the kitchen on cook stoves and ovens and the resulting uh, pollution effects of that. So what happens is nitrogen dioxide is one of the components of that. Because of that, there's a significant increased risk of asthma and uh, asthma attacks in children because of that nitrogen dioxide. So if we are cooking with gas, what, what can we do to improve air quality inside our homes? So the the main thing is to get rid of those pollutants. And so 
an exhaust fan that works, an effective exhaust fan that works is, is something that can be done on a temporary basis. The best thing to do would be to get rid of the gas stove altogether, but short of that, we need to get functioning, effective exhaustion, exhaust fans. And so if it doesn't work, get it fixed. If, it, if you don't have one, get one. Uh, and once you have it, turn it on. It doesn't work unless you turn it on. All right. And your final question. As a physician, what are, your most, what are you most concerned about regarding global heating here in Oregon? So thank you for that question because it's not just about our indoor uh, air. It's about everything about global heating. And the two things that really are worry me are smoke and high heat. The smoke leads to increase uh, heart and lung disease, the smoke from wildfires especially. And then, like the heat dome that we had in the end of June, when temperatures skyrocketed for an extended period of time, 96 Oregonians died from that excessive heat. We've got to stop this. We've got to do everything we can to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to, to try to reduce this heating of our uh, atmosphere. Thanks Jim and Doug, and thanks to you for watching this first video. I hope that you learned something about methane gas and global heating and that you will share it with others. And for more information and to find out how you can take action on climate, visit 350eugene.org, fossilfreeeugene.org, powerpastfrackgas.org, PSR org and electrifynow.net. Thank you. I'm 17 years old and I live here in Eugene, Oregon, have all my life. I'm involved in many organizations around Eugene, including Sunrise Eugene, 350 Eugene, Earth Gardens 350, a campaign called Fossil Free Eugene. I am also a plaintiff on the Juliana v. United States lawsuit. So the youth movement in, within the whole climate movement is really, really important because youth like me are going to be affected for so long um, by the choices that are made now by people that are older than us. 350 Eugene is the club at South Eugene High School that I am a leader of and is also a small organization in our community and we're super rad. We in past years have lobbied with representatives up in Salem. We have volunteered, had hold held trash pickup days. We have created a lot of rallies and walkouts of South and we've walked to the courthouse and we've been involved in many campaigns and organizations and worked together with those. And this year with COVID kind of opening things up, uh, we're starting out working with uh, Climate Revolution and we will be holding a bike-in movie instead of a drive-in movie, which should be a lot of fun. Earth Guardian 350 is a part of a newer, as of a year, team called 4J Climate Action Team, which is the collective groups of all of the 4J uh, climate action clubs. So we have some people from Sheldon and North and Churchill and South, of course and it is youth-led and teacher and faculty supported. And we are working to integrate a climate action curriculum into 4J schools. So if you would like to be involved with that, that would be super helpful. It's kind of a bigger project that we're working on right now. You can email me at saharahopeval at gmail.com. You can DM us on Instagram at eg350south and let me know if you want to get involved or if you have any questions. As people that are not youth, you can um, get involved with organizations that are youth-led and offer your support, your time, your money, any resources you have. 
but make sure you do so without you know taking over our movement without speaking over us give us space to be youth and be in this movement and show how we're affected and make sure that you are being available and as helpful as you can without um, without pushing us out of the picture. It's important that the youth movement is well connected with people from all generations so that we can create a community that uh, holds each other up and allows every person to have a voice and creates a future that is livable for everyone. Is a piece of cake. Going electric is a piece of cake. Cause the state will give you a big tax break. Cause the state will give you a big tax break. So next time we say fill her up. So next time we say fill her up. We'll be talking about our coffee cup. We'll be talking about our coffee cup. We're gonna pass on the gas. Pass on the pumps. Say goodbye to Exxon and the other greedy chumps. Leave the oil in the soil, leave the gas in the ground. But switch to electric, there's enough to go around. We're going to spark in the dark and pass up the pumps. Exxon and Mobile can blow it up the rumps. We're going to go electric and pass on the gas. Shell oil and Chevron can blow it Goes up and that drives me insane. 
Just one refueling this away. All the evenings are so fun to drive. They take up fast and make me feel alive. Pick it a little and give me a high five, high five. Just one be driving this away. Just one be driving. We all care about leaving a habitable planet and a stable climate system for our kids, but we have grave concerns about the ability of our government to meet the challenge of accelerating climate-related disasters and the related devastating social impacts. The mission of the 350 Eugene Volunteers is to raise the awareness about this emergency we face. We want to show our community the ways we can personally and collectively address the problems and then take whatever actions necessary to drive our decision makers to take bold action. We are going to need solid plans with carrots and sticks and we need them fast. There has to be grid resiliency through a balanced source of hydro, wind, solar, battery pack, backup. There also has to be action. Our primary work focuses on advancing policies that end our reliance on fossil fuels. We must transition to 100% clean energy. Our buildings and our transportation must be electrified. It's a really big change, but we can do it. The tactics our grassroots group uses include education, from tabling to presentations, events, panels, public art projects, demonstrations, and sometimes nonviolent civil disobedience. We work with young and BIPOC groups and many coalitions so we can build a broad, inclusive, and powerful movement for the change we need. Thank you for your support. We couldn't do it without help from people like you.